What's up, Unleashed Humans? I hope you brought your juice box, and I hope you brought your popcorn, because this episode is going to get super deep into the world of time-restricted eating, the world of sleep, the world of digestion, and how to harness the power of circadian rhythms to become superhuman. You probably won't find this anywhere else, so you're going to want to listen to this entire episode and even replay it a time or two. I put a ton of work into this episode in order for you to hear this, so really take note of everything in this episode. It's going to be incredible. Now, before we start, I want to give a quick shout out to my amazing sponsor, Hyvita. As you know, I've mentioned on the previous episodes on how amazing molecular hydrogen water is for your brain. Now, over 400 published medical studies support ingestion of molecular hydrogen to be a powerful antioxidant that improves circulation, athletic performance, and recovery, metabolism, and cognitive function, as I mentioned prior. Now, if you're looking to take your brain performance and happiness to another level, I totally recommend checking out Hyvita Hydrogen Water, as it is the first and only hydrogen-infused sparkling water in the world. That's Hyvita, spelled H-Y-V-I-D-A, available in three flavors, pure, raspberry, or lemon-lime. Now, for Unleashed Human listeners, as you know, you can get 10% off your purchase of Hyvita by going to Amazon and typing in the promo code UNLEASHED. Again, to receive an extra 10% off, use the promo code UNLEASHED to kick your brain, body, and health into high gear. Now, before the show starts, I also want to let you know, if you haven't already, go to www.theunleashedhuman.com slash fasting, that's a forward slash fasting, to get your free fasting guide. Again, that is www.theunleashedhuman.com forward slash fasting to get your free guide on how to fast in the different types of fasting. Now, I hope you are locked in and ready for this episode because it is going to be very science heavy but also giving you actionable steps to harness your built-in circadian rhythms to totally revamp your life. Now, I first want to start out on weight loss because we all know how Stephanie wants to impress Chad at the beach this summer with her hot bod, or that Jeff wants to have massive arms so that he can show off his new tribal tattoo to all the ladies. Whatever it is, we know that weight loss is one of the most sought-out lifestyle modifications of anything in human history. Now, mostly for aesthetic purposes and less for health purposes is the reason why we want to attain that nice body or to lose weight. Because let's face it, most of us would love to eat donuts, pastries, or desserts every day of our life if it didn't make us look like a beached whale. When in truth, we really should want to lose weight and maintain an optimum weight for longevity and vitality. How many times have you tried to lose weight but you failed? How many times have you implemented a new fad diet and it ended poorly or did nothing at all for you? Well, I'm sure if you've been successful with one diet, you have some time in your life tried a weight loss method that actually didn't work. Well, guess what? It turns out losing weight isn't so much about what you eat, but it is about when you eat. This is what this entire episode is about. You will learn that it's not so much about the donuts or the pastries you're eating. Rather, it is the time window in which you eat will give you the best results. Now, the efficacy of metabolizing and absorbing food is heavily based on the time of day and within which window of time you eat it in. The best example of this already lies inside your body, your daily blood sugar regulation cycle. When you first wake up in the morning, your response to food is best because your insulin sensitivity is highest, meaning your insulin will rapidly respond to anything that you chew and swallow, making sure to get free-floating sugars transported into your cells immediately so that you do not get a prolonged hyperglycemic response. In other words, insulin makes sure that you don't keep sugar floating around in your bloodstream. Now, as the day progresses, insulin response declines, and when dinner time hits, your insulin has slowed to a minimum and takes much longer to shovel sh- shuttle sugars into your cells. 
Now your pancreatic enzymes and stomach acid has also slowed down later in the day. This means that you should eat your largest meals in the morning or afternoon and not for dinner. There is a reason why you are always told to stay out of the pantry late at night because your body is practically worthless after a certain time and cannot break down sugars effectively. These sugars will in effect, in effect be stored as fat instead of utilizing it as immediate fuel or energy for the cell. Now, that is just one example as to why eating at certain times will affect not only your weight, but your health as well. Things like sleep, energy, focus, and happiness come from when you have routines. The more that your body understands your schedule, the easier it will be for your body to function at a high level. You will basically become a cyborg. This is a very good thing, guys. If your body knows when you're going to eat and how you're going to eat it at the certain times of day, you will become a well-oiled machine, believe me. So in this episode, we are talking sleep, we are talking eating, we will, we will be talking about light, and we are talking about routines. The most important things in our lives are those four things I just mentioned. And you will know as we go along in this episode why that is. Now, I recently read a book called The Circadian Code in, in which Dr. Sachin Panda dedicated his entire life's work to make. It is a mind-blowing book that I highly recommend. He talks about how almost every single human is a shift worker or has been a shift worker in our lifetime. Now, he doesn't literally mean being a shift worker as a profession. Rather, we have endured the stress that a shift worker endures each day by staying up late at night or going through different time zones or having jet lag. And although most of us are strict during the week by going to bed early and waking up early, we almost always stay up two hours later on the weekend and wake up two hours later. So this is actually known as social jet lag and can be the reason why you feel groggy on the weekend even after getting your 10 hours of sleep, which if you're getting 10 hours of sleep, that is actually way too much and you should probably stop if you're doing that. Now, being consistent with your sleep even on the weekends will make a world of change. Plus, you will get even more done considering you won't have to have work-related tasks blocking up your day. Now, it's been shown through research and data that shift workers and those who chronically stay up later in the night actually have more gastrointestinal diseases. They suffer from obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. In fact, the number one cause of death and work disability for firefighters is not fire, and it's not from accidents. It's actually from heart disease due to the disruption of our circadian rhythms. In 2007, the World Health Organization's Agency for Research on Cancer actually classified shift work as a potential carcinogen. This is why sleeping and eating at appropriate times will help optimize our circadian rhythms. So if you're a shift worker, either whether you're a police officer, an oil field worker, or a firefighter, or anyone that's staying up late at night, you need to listen to this. And if you know someone that is that kind of worker, you need to share this with them because they need to understand that their livelihood is at risk every time they continue to carry on with that profession. And the thing is, is that there's ways to get around it, even as a shift worker, as you will find during this episode. You see, our health is actually guided by circadian rhythms more than anything, more than food, supplements, and drinks that we consume. However, this first starts with sleep, which most humans take for granted. We were designed to wake up to the sun in the morning so that our natural cortisol cycles turn on while melatonin cycles turn down in order to kickstart all of our physiology for a new day. Now, the crazy thing is that our body primes itself before the sunlight even enters our room. Melatonin production from our pineal gland slows down, our breathing becomes faster, our heart rate picks up, a few beats per minute, and our blood pressure rises. And our core body temperature also increases a degree before we even open our eyes. On the other side of light, there is dark. We were meant to go to bed slightly after nightfall. The pineal gland begins to generate melatonin. Our core body temperature begins to drop. 
the brain begins to consolidate memories and enters a state of neurogenesis where it creates new synapses, connections, and nerve connections that may have been damaged during the day. Now you see that wake and sleep cycles are more detrimental to your health because human growth hormone is pumped out rapidly as we sleep. Those with poor sleep produce less growth hormone and can hinder growth in children and severely restrict repair mechanisms in adults. So we actually have this thing called electricity now that powers everything in our world today. We have TVs, computers, cell phones, light bulbs that stay on way past the sun goes down. These interrupt our normal sleep and wake cycles. For the longest time, we used to think that rods and cones in the back of our retina were responsible for capturing light, thus stimulating cortisol pathways. However, in 2002, three independent research groups found a light-sensing protein outside of rods and cones that orchestrate wake and sleep cycles. This protein is called melanopsin. You see, melanopsin is extremely sensitive to blue wavelength light, the same light coming from all of our artificial lighting TV screens, laptop, cell phones, you name it. And this blue light will actually trick our bodies into thinking it's daytime when it's really nighttime. This is why it is extremely important to limit screen time after dark. And if you decide to use screens, wear blue blocking glasses to shade out the harmful light. The other thing is our blue light sensing proteins directly and indirectly connect to the same brain regions that control depression, alertness, sleep, in production of sleep hormone melatonin and even regulate migraine headaches. This is powerful stuff. If you've had migraines for so long, this could be the ding, 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 ding that sets it off and makes you understand, wow, maybe for the longest time I've been having migraines because I've been exposed to this light because it's the same thing that's connected to all of our hormones that are going into our brain. Now, sleep is no joke, guys. You need to take this serious if you want to have optimal health. If you want to live a fruitful and fulfilling life, just mimic nature and you might just turn out okay. Take plants, for instance. They follow their circadian clock to a T. They only use their energy for things that matter. Plants predict the sunrise and sunset so they can optimally harvest sunlight and carbon dioxide to make food. Plants raise their leaves up an hour or two before sunrise and active, activate certain genes so they can harness the sun's light energy. And at the end of the day, they shut down their light harvesting machinery an hour or two before the sun goes down as to not waste energy. And then they eventually drop their arms and flowers completely at the end of the evening when plants prepare to go to bed. So you're probably sitting there saying, but TJ, I want to stay up and watch the latest episode of Gossip Girl and then check my news feed on Instagram and then eat a snack before bed and then go to sleep at like 1130 p.m. Well... No wonder why you're so tired. Hey, guess what? I have a better idea. Read a book that will make you smarter at 8 p.m. with blue blocking glasses on and then go to sleep at 9.30. Maybe you will actually get a good good night's rest for once. Maybe just once. Now, I have a challenge for you. Pick a time to be in bed every single night, even on the weekends. Then pick a time to fall asleep by every single night. Do this for a week straight, seven days, and see the difference in your life. For instance, be in bed by 9 p.m., asleep by 10 p.m. Now, for most of you guys, that might be a little bit of a stretch. So how about try being in bed by 10 p.m., asleep by 11 p.m.? Do that, and you might just see the biggest change in your life. It's really not that hard. You just have to be really consistent, and you have to actually want it. Now, the mind-blowing thing is that for the longest time, we suspected that circadian rhythms were only based off brain physiology to the rest of the body, but we now know that every single body, every single organ in the body has its own circadian clock, which have previously been called peripheral rhythms. Now, this discovery was first found by a researcher who infused glow-in-the-dark genes into a fruit fly. Now, these fruit flies would glow in the dark in a 24-hour clock period and would become dimmed when winding down during the nighttime. The interesting thing about flies is that when you chop them up, their organs will continue to live a few days afterwards. 
Well, when this researcher came back to see the chopped up organ parts, they were still glowing days after being chopped up and were still becoming dimmed later at night, thus proving that organs actually have their own circadian rhythms. This is a huge finding, and it was absolutely ground-shattering. This means by the time you eat and drink during the day will actually start and reset your organs clock organ clocks, meaning that your body will start to notice when to secrete digestive juices and enzymes to break down your foods. This is huge. I don't think you understand the magnitude on this. So we're going to talk about this more later. Now we first need to talk about this thing called the suprachiasmatic nucleus or SCN for short, found in the hypothalamus of the brain responsible for the centers of hunger, satiety, which means hunger, fulfilling hunger, uh, sleep, fluid balance, stress response, and much more. In fact, when you remove the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or SCN, a person will lose all of their rhythms. It is so imperative to humans that in the late stages of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease, the SCN is so damaged that the person loses all sense of time. These people go to bed wide awake. They feel hungry randomly. They go to the bathroom at random times. The SCN is the only reason we can make sense of day and nighttime. This is because melanopsin protein that we talked about earlier is directly connected to our SCN, which is why our master clock is so sensitive to blue light coming into our eyes. The SCN is indirectly connected to our pituitary gland, our adrenal gland, and pineal gland through connection with the hypothalamus. If our SCN is affected by blue light, this means it is quite literally shocking our system into thinking it's daytime and sends signals to all of our body systems and organs. This means it sends signals to our stomach clock, our liver clock, our gut clock, which will tell our organs to create digestive juices, yet there is no food being eaten. This tricks our body into thinking we are hungry for food. Thus, this is why we have late night cravings or why we make late night runs to Taco Hell or Ronald McDonald's house. Now, this is huge, but I'm going to switch gears for just a second. Let's just get something straight right now. There is no such thing as a night owl or a morning lark. There is no such thing as a night person or a morning person. These attributes also change considerably with age. Children typically wake up earlier because they go to bed earlier. Common sense math right there. However, if you are a parent who is letting their child stay awake past 9 or 10 p.m., you are severely interfering with that child's normal sleep pattern and can detrimentally affect the child's brain development and has actually led to ADHD and autism occurrences. Now, teenagers, on the other hand, typically go to bed later and wake up later. No brainer there. Teenagers are a demographic who need much more sleep anyhow, but as we age into adulthood, we actually revert to being early risers again. As kids, we naturally want nine hours of sleep, and as adults, seven hours of sleep. As we age, our sleep becomes less easier to consolidate, thus we wake up easier to sound and light. With many people thinking that their sleep is driven by genetic or calling themselves a night owl, this is fatally flawed. And your chance of having a genetic sleep variation is extremely slim. There are very few people on earth who actually have a true genetic sleep defect. Even if you have a bad gene, health habits are strong enough to override poor genes. I will prove to you right now why a person, a night person, and a morning person concept is fatally flawed with a study performed by Ken Wright Jr. at the University of Colorado Boulder. Now, Ken Wright led a camping trip for a few people who thought they were night owls. Before going on the trip, they monitored their sleep patterns and took saliva samples to figure out what time they produced their largest amount of sleep hormone, melatonin. Turns out, each of the participants had delayed onset of melatonin production. 
their melatonin didn't even kick into 10. They didn't, the melatonin didn't start kicking into gear until 10 p.m. at night. And they would peak after midnight. Now, after only two days of camping in the wilderness, the night owls, who previously thought they had a genetic predisposition to being night owls, retested their melatonin levels. What they found was that their melatonin started kicking in at 7 p.m. instead of 10 p.m. And they couldn't even stay awake past 10 p.m. The change was not due to bed comfortability or the foods that they ate. The only difference with these guys was the removal of bright light at night, cessation of stressful and excitatory activities like looking at social media and refraining from caffeine after 2 p.m. I can attest to this. When I went on a moose hunt back in September 2018, camping out in the woods for four days was some of the best sleep I had ever had. I was completely knocked out during this camping trip when we went to bed. I wasn't sleeping on anything comfortable either. I was sleeping on solid ground. The only thing I had was a night sky and the stars above, and I wasn't even on my phone at all. Now, back to food and organs. You see, we get to control when our organs sleep and wake based on the clocks we choose. This means the first bite of food we eat in the morning or the first sip of coffee, yes, coffee, will turn on our organs and reset their clocks. Yes, coffee does break a fast. Anything that the liver has to detoxify is considered breaking a fast. For the longest time, scientists thought that once we woke up, that our organs were also awake with us. However, we know now based off when we first eat, this will actually kickstart our organs and start their daily clock. This is why in the morning, you will start feeling hungry at the same time every morning because your organs have learned to know when you are supposed to eat. This concept is extremely important for you to understand. By eating at the exact same times each day, this will allow your organs to work for you instead of against you. If your stomach knows exactly when to secrete stomach acid, then your digestion will be absolutely killer. This will let your liver know how much bile to secrete and how many enzymes your pancreas needs to create for food breakdown. If your body is constantly guessing what time of the day you're going to eat, then your digestive tract is going to be caught with its pants down, looking silly. This will then lead to chronic digestion issues and irregular bowel movements. It can even lead to things like gas, bloating, constipation, malabsorption of nutrients, brain fog, nausea, acid reflux, indigestion, GERD, heartburn, skin rashes, eczema, and even more serious autoimmune conditions. Here's the other big issue. By not having a consistent schedule of eating, you could be transporting normal, healthy foods into actual fat storage. When eating occurs at random times throughout the day, your body gets confused as to where it should store the improperly digested food. So the body turns into a fat-making process and storage system. At the same time, glucose create, created from carbohydrate sources overwhelms the bloodstream, and the liver becomes inefficient in the ability to absorb glucose, which then can lead to blood sugar dysregulation and prediabetes over time. So if you have wondered why you can't lose weight, even if you are eating so-called healthy foods, timing is most likely your answer. If you have been working your butt off in the gym, counting your calories and getting rid of crappy foods and still not seeing results, I'm telling you right now, timing matters more than anything that you're eating or doing. Set a an eating routine. And you might just find that the inches around your waist will disappear. For example, eating your first meal at 8 a.m., then eating second meal at 1 p.m., and then eating your last meal at 5 p.m. This is an eating window of 9 to 10 hours, which shows phenomenal results in health and weight loss. It is more about eating at those times every single day that will make the greatest difference. So you should try that out first. Next. The other thing during our wake cycle is to get adequate physical activity. This doesn't mean you have to throw around a ton of weight in the gym or to become a cardio bunny. This just means to stay active on your feet, walk often, move in multiple planes of motion with proper form and refrain from being sedentary in seats or lounge chairs and couches. Do activities that engage your muscles because muscles are 50% of our body mass, people. Physical activity has an incredible effect on our circadian clock. 
early mice experiments, which showed that mice who had access to exercise wheels and could run on the wheel whenever they wanted, would voluntarily run on the wheel every single night. The researchers found that exercising mice have an incredible circadian clock and that these mice slept so much better and were alert and focused during their waking hours. One study showed that teenagers who performed vigorous physical activity not only improved how fast they fell asleep, but also improved their mood during the day, increased concentration, and reduced anxiety and depression. Older adults who engaged in moderate physical activity or even regular stretching improved sleep onset, sleep quality, and sleep duration and reduced their dependence on sleep medications. They also had fewer episodes of sleepiness during the day. Now, I'm going to list off the primary reasons as to why your sleep is really shitty. First off, a lot of it comes from being dehydrated. This means that you should probably drink a big glass of water two hours before bed. Now, notice I said two hours. That's very important because you don't want to, you do not want to drink a lot of liquids before bed because then you're going to be peeing all night. So do not drink anything under two hours. Allow your body to excrete the urine before going to bed so you're not you know, tossing and turning or going to the restroom all night. Secondly, make sure that your room temperature is not too hot and not too cold. The optimal temperature for humans is 64 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit each night. Make sure that you're not having any acid reflux or indigestion. This is typically because you're eating way too close to bedtime. Make sure that you're eating three hours before bedtime. This way, your body has enough time to digest food and it doesn't have to worry about breaking it down all night and you're not tossing and turning or having any kind of indigestion. Now, sleeping with an animal on your bed. Get your animal off the dang bed, plain and simple. Put them down on one of their bedding crates or whatever you have for them, but get your animal off the bed. They move way too much and it disrupts your sleep more than you know. Next, if you are unaware of your snoring or somebody else in bed that's snoring, or if you have sleep apnea, you may want to check the alignment of your jaw, your partner's jaw, or even your neck. There are studies and there are many, many anecdotal stories talking about how if your jaw is out of alignment or if your airway is blocked or any shape or form, that is why you're having snoring issues. And we're going to get into snoring and how it affects your brain and your oxygen flow a little bit later. But you should very much get that fixed if you are snoring. That's a very big deal when it comes to sleep. Now, sensitive to sound or light, put a blackout curtain up on your windows or use earplugs to make sure that sounds are not waking you up. This is a very big deal, so you should totally, totally look into doing this. It will change the way you sleep. Next, stop worrying or thinking about things. If you're thinking about things or your mind is racing, write them down on a pad of paper before going to bed. Get it out of your head. Get it down on paper. Next, too little physical activity that day. Make sure that you're walk, at least walking 30 minutes after dinner or doing some kind of activity during the day so when it comes time to go to sleep, your muscles have been worked and your body feels as if it's actually gone through some kind of vigorous activity that day. It will help your sleep. Much more on this later. Too much time looking at or being around bright light will actually stimulate your body into thinking it's daylight. So shut off all screens two hours before bedtime. Do not watch a movie or show before bed. Make sure that you're reading a book instead and do something proactive to make your brain work before bed. Again, do not look at social media and read a book instead. Now, when it comes down to it, Poor sleep quality leads to poor quality of life and poor performance the following day. People may experience brain fog, confused thinking, poor decision making, scrambled thoughts, reaction times are slower, and attention is elsewhere. We all know that research shows a person who is sleep deprived has worse performance than someone who has had two alcoholic drinks. 
Adults with poor sleep habits are likely to develop anxiety and depression, and seniors may even experience memory impairment issues and cognitive decline. Sleep deprivation directly affects our hunger and satiety hormones ghrelin and leptin, which are both controlled by circadian clocks. Ghrelin is a hormone that is produced by the stomach to signal to our brain that we are hungry. On the other side, leptin is produced in fat cells and tells our brain that we are full. Here's the rub. When poor sleep comes into play, our brain does not receive these hormone messengers properly and will cause us to overeat. This happens when we stay up later than we should, especially after a night of going out to the bars and we are hankering for a large pizza or a burger and fries. Now, a study by Ken Wright's Sleep Lab showed that those who had reduced their sleep hours from 8 to 5 hours consistently overate more calories than they would normally. A sleep-deprived brain with exposure to blue light creates mixed signals and falsely accuses yourself as being hungry and will lead to late night snacks, thus leading to weight gain. In fact, a sleep brain, a sleepy brain works better without adding food and research shows longer fasting periods lead to better brain function by keeping to a restricted eating time, increasing connections and brain synapses between cells. Now by eating late at night, Food will affect our ability to decrease our core body temperature. Normally, our body temperature should drop by about 1 degree Fahrenheit, but when we eat food later, our body will be delayed in cooling down. Instead of our core temperature going down, it will actually rise because blood rushes to the gut to help break down last minute food particles. This is why you should eat three hours before bedtime. You should also refrain from drinking alcohol before bed as it dehydrates your body more than you think. Although you may use it to fall asleep, typically you won't stay asleep and it will restrict your ability to actually get into deep sleep. If you attend to keep drinking before bed, alcoholic beverage that is, make sure to drink it three hours before bed with your meal. If getting rid of drinking before bed makes you sleep your sleep better, you may find that you don't even want to drink anymore. Now, let's talk a little bit here about snoring. Snoring is a major issue that is not being addressed enough today. I'm just going to say this right now. Snoring is no laughing matter. It is actually extremely serious. For those who don't understand, when you snore, this means you are not getting much oxygen to your brain. When we are designed to breathe, we were actually designed to breathe through our nose, not through our mouth. Snoring can happen when we are sick or other mechanical obstructions like a deviated septum or a tempomandibular joint dysfunction, aka jaw, that is out of place. These conditions are conditions which can be usually addressed now in today's age. However, By chronically snoring and not addressing the underlying issue, this can lead to early death, dementia, and brain-related memory issues. This is mainly due to chronic hypoxia, aka not getting enough oxygen to the brain. Now, for stuffy noses, you can use a saline spray or a neti pot to open passageways. Another thing to use is a Breathe Right nasal strip or ones that you can insert inside your nose to open the pathway or airway, which drastically opens the nasal airways, allowing a rush of oxygen into your brain. The other sleep issue is sleep apnea, and once you have a blockage or an obstruction in the nasal passageway or throat, this deprives your brain of oxygen and wakes you up violently as you gasp for air. However, this isn't always the case as some people can actually wake up not knowing they have sleep apnea but constantly feel tired, have a dry mouth, or have to use the bathroom a lot at night. Now, sleep apnea can lead to memory problems, attention issues, and is a major risk factor for heart disease and stroke. And two-thirds of people with sleep apnea actually have high blood pressure. So this makes sense. And if you think you have sleep apnea, I totally recommend you sign up for a sleep study as soon as you possibly can. Lastly, if 
completely necessary. You can use melatonin for sleep aids. However, I personally don't recommend it because almost nobody needs extra melatonin if your cycles are running correctly. Now, if you're traveling between time zones, the melatonin can be a good option. However, if you really need it, I guess you can, but I I personally don't like using anything else other than my own body to get into a quality sleep pattern. Now, let's switch gears for just a second from sleep to nutrition and how when we eat matters more than what we eat. Now, for the longest time, we thought that calories in and calories out is what the driver of weight loss and weight gain was. We also thought that by eating a certain way, i.e. keto, paleo, Atkins, low carb, carnivore, vegan, vegetarian was the answer to all of our problems dealing with weight loss. Well, guess what? I can safely say all of it is absolute garbage. We now know that timing means everything. Now, Dr. Sachin Panda and his team of researchers performed a study in mice in 2012, which is absolutely ground shattering. In 2012, their team proved this concept. They pair they had pairs of genetically identical mice born to the same parents and raised in the same home. They fed one group of mice a high fat, high sugar diet, and these mice could eat whenever they wanted all day long. They fed the other group of mice the same high fat, high sugar diet with the same amount of food portions, but this group had to eat all of their food in an eight hour window. Now the mice with the eight hour window learned quickly to eat the same number of calories as the mice that had access to food all the time. In other words, the mice who could eat 24 seven, ate small meals throughout the entire day, while mice on an eight hour schedule at the same number of calories just in larger meals within the eight hours. Over the 12 weeks of time, the mice who could eat all day long showed metabolic diseases, atherosclerosis, and diabetes. But the mice who ate the exact same diet but only ate within an eight-hour window were completely protected from all diseases normally seen with the high-fat, high-sugar diet. The mice eating in an eight-hour window had normal blood sugar and normal cholesterol levels as well. The reason for this primarily comes from the digestive system not being overly taxed by food all the time, like the mice who could eat 24-7. This means the eight-hour window mice had 16 hours to digest food without interruption and allowed for repair of the gut lining and gut microbiome, which harbors billions of healthy gut bacteria responsible for our well-being. This time-restricted eating aligned perfectly with the mice's circadian rhythm and led to weight loss, and they stayed healthier long-term. These results showed far greater effects of quality of life than using a drug to treat the same condition. Remember, the diet between these two mice groups did not change. The diet was exactly the same. The only difference between these groups of mice was the time in which they ate the food. Furthermore, they studied the mice to see how long they could expand the window until the benefits of time-restricted eating was exhausted. What they found is that if the mice went over a 12-hour window, then the benefits would no longer apply. But maximum benefit and weight loss typically shows best results in the 8-10 to hour window of eating. What is even more interesting is that they did studies in humans showing that the best time to eat in your window is morning and afternoons. This means starting your window earlier in the day by eating breakfast and lunch, thus making these two meals the biggest meals of the day and having a small snack towards the end of your window if you so choose. This is primarily because your insulin response is much higher in the morning and afternoon. At dinner time, our insulin response is much lower and we don't absorb food as well later in the day. That is why dinner should be the smallest meal of the day if you choose to eat dinner.
Now, let's talk light exposure as we're switching gears here. Most of us humans are office and residential dwellers these days. Nearly 90% of our lives are spent indoors, which means we aren't getting exposed to the same amount of light that we used to get when we lived out in nature. Even if we were in the shade or under canopies during a stormy day when we lived off the land, we still received a lot of light and a lot of rays from the sun above. Now, light that is captured by our eyes for therapeutic or non-therapeutic dosages are measured in lux. This is the actual measurement. Now, daytime outdoor light is usually between 1,000 lux, which is a cloudy day, up to 200,000 lux, which is full sun exposure in a desert. Now, as a reference for our daily life, by working in an office without windows, this is equivalent to 100 lux, which is puny. And our homes with overhead lights can be as low as 50 lux, which is absolutely garbage. This is terrible light, and it is extremely unhealthy for human circadian rhythms. There are most certainly... Of these, these issues are certainly affecting our circadian clocks and shape our mood, our ability to learn, our memory recall, and work ability in office spaces. Our body needs real natural light in order to truly function to our best ability. When we first wake up, bright light hits our sensor, melanopsin, and rapidly starts pumping out cortisol so that we can feel alert and begin energizing for the day ahead. Blasting yourself with light in the morning will literally jumpstart your day, which will increase your mood and increase your productivity. You need at least one hour per day of daylight exposure where you can soak up at least 1,000 lux of light, L-U-X, lux of light, to reduce sleepiness, Stay happy, stay productive, and increase mood. If you're indoors, it is best to sit next to the largest window possible to get as much as light as you can. Move as close to the window as you can because the further you move away, the less lux light you get. Now, as the day winds down, start preparing for nightfall. Limit your exposure to screens. You can use applications on your laptop such as f.lux to dim your screen to an orange color and you can use blue blocking glasses like I mentioned earlier. You can get these on Amazon for like 10 bucks. I'm actually wearing them right now as I'm doing this podcast. Now let's switch over to exercise and what science shows to be the best time for exercising based on exercise type and for exercise performance. According to the American Heart Association, anyone healthy enough to exercise needs at least 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise per week, which breaks down to 30 minutes of moderate exercise a day, five times a day. This exercise doesn't have to be intense or having you to do backflips. It just means you need to move your body. Whether that is strength training, running, walking, or even stretching exercises or practices like Tai Chi. Stretching is extremely important as we age, as we lose motor function, awareness, and balance of our body, which usually leads to falls and broken hips. Your workout regimen can be as easy as doing a brisk walk 30 minutes in the morning, after breakfast, and 30 minutes after dinner. Notice I said brisk. Yes, brisk. Studies show that the quicker you move during your day will lower your chance for cognitive decline. So walk with a purpose because those who walk slower are actually at risk for mental impairment later. Things like Alzheimer's or, or Parkinson's or any kind of cognitive issue, neurodegenerative issue is actually linked to a slower way of life. So when you're walking, walk fast, not slow. Now, earlier we talked about how exercise and physical activity leads to greater sleep. Things like doing manual labor all day, going hiking and camping, and even walking around amusement parks can really tire us out. But we have now found that there is a reason for being tired after a long day of work and activity. Studies show that after exercise, our muscles produce a molecule called interleukin-15, which has previously been known to increase bone mass. 
However, we now know that interleukin-15 has effects on our sleep, as one study showed that rabbits injected with small amounts of interleukin-15 was found to have better sleep and deeper sleep. Secondly, our muscle cells produce another molecule called irisin. Interestingly enough, many obese people actually have lower quality of sleep due to the fact that they lack muscle and have more fat. Since they have less muscle, this means they have less irisin to put them to sleep, and less irisin has been correlated with obstructive sleep apnea, and more exercise can actually decrease sleep apnea, which is quite fascinating. If you're looking to burn maximum fat, then your best bet is to work out first thing in the morning on a 10 to 12 hour fast. This is because you will tap into your stored body fat for energy during your exercise. Your muscles will spend more energy using even more fat as the energy source, which will quite literally melt away more body fat. However, this is not always the greatest for endurance activity. One of the greatest things you can do first thing in the morning is to take a morning walk because this accomplishes two things. It gets you moving so that your body can turn on and it also gets your body exposed to blue light from the morning sunrise. You are doing double to wake your body up. This will surely increase your mood and performance for the day. Same thing for the gym. If you're going to the gym, find a really big window that is letting in a ton of light to hit your melanops and sensors. If it is a cold morning, even better. By being exposed to cold weather, you activate brown fat tissue, which is a ton of mitochondria, which are the powerhouses of our cells, that when activated, push out a ton of energy and enables our fat cells to burn more. So activating brown fat on a cold morning or a day can help you lose extra weight. Now, if you're an athlete or someone looking to have an amazing weightlifting session, your best bet for training is in the afternoon, specifically from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Science has shown that our muscle tone rises during this time, and your risk for energy injury is actually much lower. Blood flow and blood pressure are also higher in the afternoon, which may help ox- the oxygenation of muscles. And numerous studies show that motor coordination and strength peaks around late afternoon. Now, let's take the NFL National Football League, for example— If a West Coast team travels to play an East Coast team for an 8 o'clock Eastern game, the West Coast team actually has the physical advantage over the East Coast team because the West Coast team is actually playing inside their window of high athletic performance because for the West Coast team, their circadian clock would still be set to 5 p.m. Pacific time. Pretty neat, huh? I thought so. Now, for the non-athlete, late afternoon or evening exercise has two practical benefits other than wanting to be better in the gym. Exercise is known to reduce appetite, so this can help curb your craving for food to eat a lot at dinner time. Also, exercise is known to help our muscles take up more glucose without depending on insulin. This is amazing. This is extremely important because we know that insulin response decreases towards the end of the day. As little as 15 minutes of exercise in the evening will boost our muscles' ability to absorb glucose without relying on insulin and will keep our blood glucose within a healthy range. How freaking cool is that? We don't even need insulin. Our muscles are doing all the work for us. It's amazing. What is even more interesting is that the time in which we eat has a profound effect on how much muscle mass that is created. In mice, researchers found that when the mice ate within an 8 to 10 hour window, after 36 weeks, these mice had a 10 to 15% more muscle mass compared to to mice who ate all day long. Wow. Now, time-restricted eating also shows to enhance endurance. This is because time-restricted eating boosts signals for muscle repair and regeneration to help sustain or build muscle mass, and the increased physical activity helps soak up more glucose from the bloodstream into muscle. 
Researchers have also found a link to time-restricted eating and motor coordination. Mice who ate in a 8-10 to 10 hour window were able to balance themselves on a rotating drum for 20% longer than those mice who were eating all day long. This is absolutely groundbreaking because as we age as humans, we lose our ability to balance ourselves. This will lead to less falls and slips as we age as a person starts adopting a time-restricted eating window. Now, let's switch gears towards digestion and time-restricted eating. Most people don't understand that the intricacies of digestion. They think foods come in, it tastes good, we swallow, and then we poop it out. It's a little more complex than that. Your digestion starts as soon as you think about food, as soon as you smell food, and as soon as you see food. If you think about the taste of a lemon or a warhead candy, if you've ever had one, your mouth starts to water because you are imagining the sour taste once it touches your taste buds. But you don't even need to taste it. Just the thought alone starts creating the saliva in your mouth because you're thinking of that sour taste. This is your body's way of preparing itself to secrete pancreatic enzymes for your saliva and gastric juices to break down food properly. This is being because the cephalic stage starts in the mouth with the secretion of saliva even before we chew our first bite. Once we chew the food, even more saliva is produced to help masticate and lubricate the throat to go down into our stomach. While we chew, the stomach is producing stomach acid. This phase of digestion is one-third of our digestion, and we haven't even swallowed the food yet. This is extremely important that you understand that because by you chewing your food properly, you make it very hard for your digestion to work well if you don't chew well. So by chewing, you actually help out your stomach and your intestines break down, absorb, and assimilate the nutrients into your bloodstream to the targeted cells that they need to go to. So if you're not chewing well, you are not doing yourself a favor, okay? Now, stomach acid is your friend. Don't believe all the nonsense surrounding alkaline diets or alkaline water. It is absolute bullshit. We are naturally acidic people, and by trying to make your stomach alkaline is the most idiotic thing that you can do. Stomach acid protects us from bacteria, viruses, and infections. When you take Tums, when you take acid reflux medications and proton pump inhibitors like Pribilosec, you are opening your body for attack from bacteria and viruses. You also open yourself for serious diseases. The food will then, from our stomach, go to our intestines and it moves by way of muscle contractions in our intestines called peristalsis. This peristalsis is much more active during the morning and afternoon and slows down at night. Again, showing that you really want to eat food earlier in the day so that you can optimize your digestion and you don't allow food to sit in your intestines at night. This is why it is important to walk after your last meal of the day to increase the gut motility in your intestines so that it gains more electrical impulses to push the food along towards the colon for excretion of feces. Now, on a side note, the reason why we don't get hungry during sleep is because our body reduces the hormone ghrelin that we talked about earlier. This is the hormone that tells our brains we are not hungry. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the hormone that we are hungry. Leptin is the opposite. So at night, ghrelin is, is suppressed so that we don't wake up feeling hungry. However, if we don't get enough sleep, our ghrelin levels go up and it makes us think we are hungry. Okay, now we're going to switch gears here and we're going to talk about the gut microbiome. Now, the gut microbiome has been shown to be highly circadian. In other words, we go to bed with certain bacteria and we wake up with different sets of bacteria. We even have different sets of bacteria in the middle of the day compared to when we first woke up. They change rapidly to the emotions of our day, the foods we eat, and the drinks we consume. Some enzymes in our body are not enough to break down foods and further aid is needed by our gut microbiome instead. 
We also know that a jet-lagged person will see a radical change in their gut microbiome. This was tested by taking a person's feces, a human person, who had been traveling across time zones. They placed the human feces into a healthy mouse. Now, the mouse then became obese, and when a healthy person's feces were placed into a healthy mice or mouse, the mouse actually stayed just as healthy as they did before. It just goes to show that going through different time zones and having disrupted sleep will actually affect not only your mental outlook, but it will actually affect your organs and your gut microbiome, which then will actually affect the way you absorb foods. And it just goes to show they used it in a mouse and the mouse actually was affected and became very unhealthy. And that is very profound. Now, studies have been shown that feeding mice a high-fat, high-sugar diet radically changed the health of the, the mouse's microbiome, leading to pathogenic strains of bacteria that led to obesity and other health-related conditions. However, when they did the exact same high-fat, high-sugar diet in mice who were restricted to an eight-hour window, those same pathogenic strain of bacteria were suppressed and the mice remained healthy with a flourishing gut microbiome without any issue. Again, guys, it just goes to show that when you eat and follow circadian rhythms, this makes a world of difference in your health and everything in your life. Here's the practical and logical approach to eating. I will make it very simple for you. Eat at the same time every single day. This takes all the guesswork out of digestion and your body will never have to guess when it has, is going to be fed. When you eat at the same time every day, your digestive clock will optimize itself to make you a food burning machine. This means your gut and your stomach will secrete acids and enzymes way before you even think about eating food. You see, eating at random times can lead to more issues than you think. It can lead to indigestion, irregular bowel movements, and even constipation. All of these may seem normal to you because you've been treating your digestion like crap without even knowing it. No pun intended. Now, your normal gut bacteria also changes, not for the good either. This can lead to body-wide inflammation with symptoms like fatigue, skin rashes, arthritis, joint pain, and food sensitivities. This will then take control of your immune system and it can open yourself for autoimmune conditions and bacterial infections. Now, this sounds like an exaggeration, but believe me, it's not. Circadian clocks are extremely powerful if you harness them for good and extremely harmful if you work against them. Now, time-restricted eating has been shown to decrease systemic inflammation as a powerful immune-boosting strategy. The reason why our immune system is boosted during time-restricted eating is due to improved digestive health. When we use time-restricted eating more often, it repairs our gut lining and our gut microbiome, which are main lines of defense from bacteria and undigested foods. Time-restricted eating methods utilize more fat as energy, which will utilize old inflammatory stores of fat, which in turn will rid the body of old toxic fat stores. Time-restricted eating also protects our brains by creating a stronger brain barrier so that only oxygenated blood can be shuttled to the brain, making sure that no other bacteria or cellular debris enter the brain. We will see our immune system ramp up during time-restricted eating because cells produce more antioxidants to kill free radicals, which in turn stimulates a process called autophagy which is a process that eats old damaged cells and then shuttles them out for elimination. Now, time-restricted eating is also showing amazing results in those with certain cancers. A recent study showed that women who maintained a regular eating schedule and in, a, and in an 11-hour eating window were significantly protected from breast cancer, which makes sense as time-restricted eating significantly reduces inflammation and the spreading of malignancies throughout the bloodstream. To add more to the discussion, they, they tested this in mice. A group of scientists placed tumors in three groups of mice. The first group of mice lived under normal light-dark cycles. The second group of mice had 
their light dark cycles changed every few days as if they were traveling through different time zones or working night shift work. They found that the tumors in the shift work or the time zone changing group grew more aggressively. However, there was a third group, and in the third group of mice, they were also subjected to shift work or time zone changes, but were only given food for 12-hour windows. Astonishingly, the third group of mice saw tumor growth reduce by as, as much as 20% in only seven days. Now, there have been other studies showing that certain cancer treatments are more effective at certain times of the day. For instance, two groups of mice were given total body irradiation therapy for cancer. One group received treatment in the morning while the other group received treatment in the evening. The morning group mice lost 80% of their hair, but the group in the evening retained 80% of their hair. This makes sense because my circadian clock works opposite of ours because they are nocturnal creatures and we are diurnal. This goes to show that cancer treatments must be timed precisely based off our circadian rhythms to make treatments most effective. Now, time-restricted eating is very protective to the brain, as I stated earlier, but for another reason. When we eat in a window of 8 to 10 hours, this means that the other 14 to 16 hours is spent resting, digesting, and breaking down fat storages. These fat storages create ketones, which are found in the presence of fasting. These ketones are extremely neuroprotective from the brain. They can improve overall function of the brain and are very effective in those with seizures. This has been shown to dramatically decrease brain inflammation and brain fog related issues. Ketones provide chemical signals that protect neurons from injury and are more readily repaired after damage. The brain is much more protected when it comes to neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Huntington's disease. Eating the same time every day and maintaining a long period without food will synchronize your brain's circadian clock, which will then boost quality of sleep, better heart rate, blood pressure, and overall well-being. Practicing time-restricted eating while participating in an exercise regimen has been shown to dramatically increase brain-derived neurotropic factor, which strengthens the connection between neurons and improves memory. The benefits of time-restricted eating and exercise has been so profound that mice that were deliberately subjected to toxins that are known to cause stroke, Parkinson's disease, and Huntington's disease were actually able to withstand the deleterious effects because they were exercising regularly and eating within a restricted time window. Now, by this point, if you are not sold on the time-restricted eating, circadian rhythms, avoiding light at night, blasting yourself with light in the morning, exercising regularly, and while fasting, and adopting a schedule where you eat at the same time every single day, then I don't know if I can help you. The science that shows that eating inside a window is actually more important than what you actually eat. However, I would still suggest that you eat organic vegetables and grass-fed organic meats whenever you can. If I had a recommendation, I would eat breakfast at 8 a.m., eat lunch at 1 p.m., and then eat my last meal at 6 p.m. Remember that breakfast and lunch should be your biggest meals by far, and dinner should be small because of how insulin responds later in the day. But remember, you must stay consistent so that your body becomes accustomed to this schedule. If you'd like to adopt an 8-hour window, then eat breakfast at 10 a.m. instead of 8 a.m., or eat your last meal at 4 p.m. instead of 6 p.m. Work it around for your own schedule, but remember, eat three hours before bedtime so that you have adequate time to digest your food. With that being said, guys, that is all for me on this podcast episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. I love doing these episodes and these type of episodes basically giving you the nitty-gritty facts down to the details. Now, if you like it, please reach out to me. Tell me if you enjoy these kind of episodes. I know they're a little bit longer, but it is me just giving you every single detail 
that you need to know, all the research that backs it up, and everything that you can use every day to make your life better. If you haven't already, go to www.theunleashedhuman.com forward slash fasting to get your free fasting guide. Again, that is www.theunleashedhuman.com slash fasting to get your free guide on how to fast and the different types of fasting. And with that, guys, I am out of here. Stay tuned for the next episode. I think you're really going to enjoy the next guest I'm having on the show. You are 100% not going to want to miss it. So I hope to see you guys soon, and I cannot wait to share what I have next. Take care, guys. Love you.